reference. Uh, so it's supposed to be up to 80 minutes or so. And uh, we have a set of papers uh, that, uh, that are original, but maybe they didn't go uh, well together with some other uh, group of papers. So all of these uh, interesting work is grouped into one uh, session. So you are lucky to be here to uh, get to see different uh, types of uh, work. So the way uh, we will run the session is um, whenever uh, well, we'll go through this, uh, this order and uh, five of these uh, work is about 10 minutes long and uh, two of them uh, is about uh, five minutes long. And uh, I will be playing a, the pre-recorded video, but uh, most of the speakers are here. Um, and basically you can ask your questions through the chat. And maybe after the talk, I'll give you a chance to ask your question uh, verbally as well. And uh, if the speaker is, uh, uh, is available at the time, then they'll be able to uh, uh, answer. So, so you'll be, you will be uh, staying on mute otherwise, uh, but you can uh, use the chat feature uh, more freely. And uh, if you are, you are having, having any kind of uh, audio issues or et cetera, you can let me know through the chat uh, as well. So uh, we are going to start with the first, uh, uh, first talk. And uh, this is a talk by University of uh, Tokyo on inductively coupled uh, wireless bus interface. So, inductive coupling and non-conductive coils. Hello, everyone. I'm Jinjiro Kadomoto from the University of Tokyo. In this presentation, I'd like to talk about set changeable template based computer systems, which utilize inductive coupling and non-conductive coils to connect multiple chips wirelessly. Through the miniaturization of chips and the reduction of power consumption, computer systems can now be mounted on various edge devices. This study focuses on chip changing applications such as micro robots and user interfaces. The micro robot is assumed to be a robot that can be operated and deformed to the size of a few megahertz. The user interface this study focuses on is swarm user interfaces, which are being studied in the human computer interaction research community. Swarm user interfaces are built using collections of self propelled physical objects that can move collectively and react to user input. Existing micro robots and user interfaces comprise simple actuators and sensors, but no high performance computer. The challenge in such applications is how to mount the computer system on its devices, wherein the system must be able to use any complex shapes and deformations. Overcoming this challenge will create the possibility to realize smart micro robots that can perform autonomous distributed calculation processing and deformable user interfaces that perform advanced sensing processing on devices. Based on this background, we have proposed wireless bus technology, which connects small chippers wirelessly using inductive coupling between on-chip coils. These on-chip coils are formed of standard internal meta wires. Unlike conventional wireless communication technology that uses electromagnetic waves such as PLE, the proposed interface uses near field inductive coupling. So it realizes the communication that is at least three digits higher bandwidth than PLE with a power consumption of the same order. Wireless bus technology enables flexible system implementation. It is possible to realize a uh, system in which chips are connected like a fiber, or a uh, system in which the real table angle between chips is slanted or the shape is deformed during operation. In combination with wireless power and supply technology, it is also possible to mount the chip on a substrate such as plastic or fiber that does not have a conductor. A new computer system can be realized. A detailed system can be built up simply by fixing and arranging the necessary chips with something like film adhesive tape. Prior to realizing a safe and computer using the wireless bus interface, it is crucial to verify whether or not communication among multiple chips is possible. It is indispensable to put 
tại và xây còn thật sự với anh check the competition đó là multiple tactics in a complex environment that takes into account the noise generated by each target. In this work, we show the first microchip processing prototype which utilizes the wireless bus interface. Let's look at the fancy work work Here, the coil is delivered by two inverters. The current IG flows to the coil in the direction corresponding to the previous data. As you can see on the right side of the slide, and as a result, a pulse voltage corresponding to the data transition of this data is generated on the receiving side. The polarity of the pulse varies depending on whether the data transition is low to high or high to low. This pulse voltage is restored to the original non-retentive zero data on the receiving side by the catalysis comparator. And the final LC data is obtained as shown in the bottom right. This technology uses a coil with a large pulse resistance and capacity as a low to value. So it does not radiate in the magnetic waves as in general wireless communication. In addition, it is not affected by unbended electromagnetic waves. Therefore, other circuits can be placed inside the coil. Moreover, even if multiple chips are placed next to each other, the communication characteristics do not change. On the other hand, the communication distance is limited to the short distance where the coils are inductively coupled. Let's move on to the overall architecture of the public interface. A parallel signal sent from the processing core, such as CPU or GPU or another accelerator core is serialized for bus transport. The reliability of inductive coupling is the same as that of wired communication. So advanced error correction is not necessary. Only minimum parity check and the start and bit values. In addition to transmitter circuit and receiver circuit aforementioned, a circuit for collision detection is installed. Where collision occurs, data is retransmitted according to the procedure defined by the upper transfer protocol. The overall architecture of a processing system was also defined. In addition to components of a standard embedded processor, the proposed chip has the network interface and transfer circuit for wireless communication. In addition, an object coil for transmission and reception is formed on the outer periphery of the chip. The figure on the left shows the general purpose processor, memory, accelerator cores, and sensor chips. Also have network interfaces and transceiver circuits in addition to the main circuits. By arranging multiple such chips next to each other, the entire system can be constructed. A Pocta chip in 0.18 micrometer CMOS technology was designed and fabricated. The Ponta chip has a RISC five processor core, service circuits, and wireless communication circuits. Consumer and receiver cores are placed on the same chip, and their sizes are 1 mm by 2 mm. Pictures of the whole chip on each circuit, uh, as shown on the slide. Printed circuit board for the variation of the chip were also designed and fabricated. In the experiment, the general purpose output of the processor core was observed using FPGA boards to confirm whether the processor and the service circuit were operating as expected. The maximum transfer rate of the wireless channel was measured by directly inputting the high speed non return to zero signal from the outside of the chip. By using bit error rate tester, the detailed bit error rate characteristics of the wireless channel were measured. Using the portal chip, we evaluated the operation of the processor core and the interface. We demonstrated for the first time that wireless communication between different chips is possible. The correct operation of the processor core was confirmed by executing a simple test code. No error occurred even when the wireless interfaces were operated at the same time. We also evaluated the channel characteristics of the wireless bus interface. When a high speed signal was input from the outside of the chip, the serial transmission of two random binary sequence signal with a maximum of 1.6 gigabit per second was achieved. The bit error rate was still 10 to the minus 12 power, regardless of the processor cooperation. We also successfully achieved our data transmission among processor cores and demo 
for it, that wireless communication could be achieved between three process efforts and multiple channels. In this prototype, a low speed silent circuit was used. Yes, the password was already power transmission was 2.2 megabit per second, which was low compared to the password was already on the channel. This problem can be easily resolved by installing an existing high speed server circuit. This slide shows a comparison among the state of the art wireless transceiver chips with our chip antenna for chip to chip communication. The prototype shown in this study only realizes integration of a single chip including a service in the processor core. Although the communication distance is short, it achieves high speed and power saving communication compared with that in a previous study on impulse radio for the wide band. When compared to a previous study of a minute away, it is observed that the prototype is superior in power consumption while it is inferior in communication speed. Communication speed and power consumption can be by miniaturizing the coil and technology scaling. The first processor prototype with the wireless interface for changing the chip and based systems was demonstrated. On chip coils were formed along the outer periphery of the H chip, and high speed wireless communication between multiple chips is enabled via horizontal and compact in the coils. Future work includes wireless power transport circuit design and development of micro robot prototypes. Thank you for your attention. All right. Um, so the speaker is here. If you have any questions, we can uh, ask it. Does anyone have any questions? You can try unmuting yourself. Um, so Kadomoto-san, uh, maybe I have a high level question. So what is your plan for like uh, using these shape changeable chips? Uh, I understand the wireless interface, but how will these computers be used eventually? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, you mean application? Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, I think it is useful for micro robots or shape changeable user interface uh, shown in the uh, first slide of the presentation. Yeah. Uh, I think, it, yes, the micro robot is the um, most promising application of this technology. I see. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Uh, thanks. Uh, let's move to the second talk then. Hello, everyone. My name is Chung Chang. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to introduce my recent research. Stair matching is the process of matching two images taken from cameras in different positions on the same antipolar line. Each pixel in the reference image is matched to several pixels within a defined search rank in the target image around the antipolar line. The disparity between the matching pixels is then used to calculate the distance between the camera and the object. The larger the disparity, closer the distance. A large search range represents a large calculation, which results in slow processing. But this is a problem because a lot of applications that use stair matching require fast processing. Recently, a lot of research has been done in this area. As you can see here, most of the good solutions have been based on an EPA. Many algorithms have also been accelerated on GPU, but they have not achieved good results. This is because most of the original algorithms are not suitable to work efficiently on the limited architecture of a GPU with various characters. In order to make them more efficient, we need to make some adjustments to the existing algorithms. 
ethnicity says looks at uh, salary regions A and C. This is a popular template matching used to calculate the similarity between two units. When we use the NCC for stair matching, we compare a target window oh, with a group mining window to on the target window to find the best disparity. However, the original NCC formula requires a lot of memory, which leads to a heavy data transmission and slow processing. By extending the formula, we can remove a lot of repeating calculation and with less memory. Now, only the red part of the formula needs to be repeated with the rest of the formula being constant. The red section can then be treated as a convolution. When we use the GPU to accelerate the spare matching, this matching between any two windows with different disparities is processed in parallel. Then the original GNCC usually processes horizontally across the entire image. In each row, the convolution can be implemented efficiently by calculating the difference between any two adjacent windows. However, we have to recalculate the convolution for the beginning of each row because it's impossible to save all the results of the whole row to the limited cache. Either way, we hope that the calculated part can be reduced efficiently so that we propose to perform a zigzag scanning on the images. As you can see here, the overlapping section can be reduced, which requires less memory. At the same time, the sum of each row and the column in each window are stored as its intermediate result to make later calculation more efficient. However, this requires too much memory for a GPU. To fix this memory problem, we propose that our zigzag scanning method to use less memory. Compared to other ZNCC methods, our method is the fastest. And when compared to other stair matching systems, ours has the lowest average among all the real time systems. Thank you. Right, any questions on this talk? Is the speaker here? Yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Um, I guess uh, so. Basically, you proposed uh, a more efficient method for stereo matching. Yeah. Um, so uh, maybe. Let's look at the uh, results. So you compared to which other methods? So, sorry? Uh, the original refers to which methods? The original, uh, yeah, the original algorithm is that I just uh, calculated the ZNCC directly without any, uh, they scan the image or only uh, not along the two decisions, only from left to the right, from the up to the down, uh, for one row, uh, one by scan the row one by one, just uh, as a um, default scan method. Okay. And any other questions from the audience? I, I forgot to mention, so this talk was from uh, National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology Research Institution in Japan for, uh, for information for some of the viewers. So thank you. Okay. We are going to uh, move to the uh, next talk. Hello everyone. My name is Xia Tian. I am assistant professor.
in the middle and let's say confuse the link. Let's see. Hello, everyone. So the, yeah, the next talk will My be from. Name is uh, I am an assistant professor from St. Dalton University. The topic for my presentation today is exploring vector speculation and data locality with fast matrix vector multiplication on Intel CPU. Here is the outline of my talk. First, I will introduce the SPM way on Intel CPU. This fast matrix vector multiplication features some computation between a very sparse matrix and a dense vector, and the result is also a dense vector. In many, if, in many algorithms, it requires many iterations with the same matrix and multiple different vectors. This gives us the possibility to optimize the structure of A for better performance because the cost of preprocessing will be amortized among the many iterations. Uh, we evaluate the SPM way on Intel based on the sparse matrix graph-based matrix selected from the field sparse matrix collection. We use the same code CPU with the scaling architecture and the latest version of mass kernel library. Uh, we do the profiling using the official v uh, twin profiler from the Intel. And here is the result of the profiling. We can see that the effective execution, which is retiring, is very poor as it only takes a 34 percentage of the total execution. And the two major bottlenecks is the bad speculation and the memory access. We can see that this observation is suitable on most graph-based bus metrics. Then we analyze the bottleneck in details. We can see that in the CSR format, Computation. So it exists uh, two kinds of regularities. First is that the different loops uh, exist among different rows, which means a random branch prediction. Another factor is that the different rows occur from different vector positions, which means it is hard to get a catch line re reuse among different rows. As we know, that most, most modern super scalar CPU relies on the branch prediction to increase the pipeline efficiency. However, a wrong prediction may cause a very serious penalty because it requires the CPU to invalidate the speculatively executed instructions and to recover the CPU state to the blank point. All these actions may undermine the performance. We also know that the branch predictor uses a local and a, hit and a global branch history for the prediction. However, in the case of SPM way, such prediction is impossible because by nature it has no pattern to catch. However, we can say that with the shorter rows, it tends to have a more frequent and wrong predictions. And with uh, longer rows, we tend to have a less frequent wrong prediction. This leads us to the conclusion that the speculation penalty is influenced by the non zero density of each row. The Matrices. The left group of matrices has a bad locality because all the non zeros are scattering all over the space. On the other hand, the other matrices have a good locality because the non zeros are in the diagonal band. So we can say that the number locality is influenced by the non zeros distributing rather than intensity. We can measure the graph based matrix locality. Using the diagonal band, we measure the proportion of non zeros in the band as shown in the picture. From the above analysis, we can see that uh, sparse and dense metrics may be bounded from different kinds of performance bound. To verify this assumption, we divide the metrics into sparse and dense subtle matrices according to the number of non zeros of each row. And for each sub matrix, we run the SPM, SPMV. A routine and run the bottleneck analysis separately. As we can see in this comparison, the sparse submetrix takes up most of the total runtime, and for the dense submetrix, its uh, major bottleneck is the memory access. For the sparse submetrix, it is bounded by both the memory access and the speculation. Now, the speculation is the most uh, crit critical. 
a performance bound. This down to a power analysis. You can see this target model fairly measures the level of memory and the speculation allocation according to the structure of metrics. In the same sense, the less non zero goals tend to have a higher speculation penalty, and the poly metrics matrix tends to have a higher memory penalty. So then we can assign different optimization goals to different kinds of metric structures. So to, to optimize speculation, we propose the density based optimization method, which we group together those with the same length so that the application rules have the similar loop pattern. As we can show that after this optimization, we can have a better speculation, but uh, we also break the original metric structure and the Y sequence, which may be a problem, which we will discuss later. So to optimize the memory access, we propose a bookmark-based optimization. We will supplement each row and the downscale is those bookmaps according to the uh, picture, and uh, then they put those of the same, same bitmap into the buckets. After, this, after the buckets are generated, they order the buckets with the grid coding so that the adjacent buckets only have one bit difference. In this method, we also consider for the dense rows, where most uh, uh, of the bitmap of it may be or one. In this case, we use the threshold to select only the more dense sections as shown in this picture. As a result, we have a better memory locality on the poly banded metrics, but they have no effect on the highly banded metrics because for such kind of metrics, it's better to go with its original structure. Uh, then to consider the problem of DDO, which means it uh, degrades the memory locality as it breaks the original structure. We can, we can combine it with the BDO if the, the metric is polybanded. As we can show in this picture, uh, we can use the BDO instead of each BDO group so that the uh, memory access inside each group is, uh, is uh, improved. We also use a reverse grid ordering among different groups so that the overall memory access is optimized, uh, improved. As a result, for the quality binding matrix, we can result in a both a better speculation and a better memory locality. This leads to the overall optimization scheme. Our scheme follows the principle of the penalty model. The first split of the matrix into the sparse submatrix by the number of non zeros of each row. We already know that the sparse matrix have a higher speculation penalty. The problem is that if it is also suffered from a memory penalty. If the answer is yes, then we only need to optimize the speculation using the DPO method. Otherwise, we use a combination of DPO and DPO to optimize both the speculation and the locality. On the other hand, for the test metrics, we already know that it is not suffering from speculation, so we don't care about the branch prediction. We only need to verify if it is bounded by the memory penalty. If the answer is yes, we use the PPO to alleviate this, this penalty. Otherwise, we don't do anything and just keep it in the original structure. For the evaluations, we evaluate our measure on sparse and this matrix separately. We can see that for the sparse matrix, only the PPO measure have already achieved a considerable speed up. When it is combined with the PPO measure, we have a further boost up speed up. Then for the test metrics, we can see that only the PPO is required to optimize for the memory access, and it has a, a obvious effect on metrics which is not uh, highly binding. Then we evaluate for the full metric performance. We choose the baseline to be the original MKL STM routine. And we use our method to compare with the official MPL optimization method. And we test it on the 86 graph based matrices. Here is the evaluation results on both the right thread and the fifth thread. Our performance outperforms the MPL optimization with a great margin. And what is more important is that our method helps the MPL optimization achieve even higher speed up. 
because all methods have a better optimization rate and a better evaluation efficiency. Here is the free protection cost of our method. We can see that all methods have an extremely low cost compared with the MPL optimization, which takes like 26 times of the one shot SPM we executed, where our method only takes four times of the SPM we executed. This means our method can be totally ignorable considering the many iterations which is used in the actual algorithm. Awesome. Right. Any uh, any questions on this one? So this was a talk by uh, Xi'an Jiatong University in China. Is the speaker here? Yes, I'm here. Hi. Okay. Uh, I had a question. Maybe it's a simple question. Hopefully, uh, I was trying to understand what this retiring portion does. Okay, the, the retiring uh, portion actually it measures the uh, uh, actually the, this is uh, the, the statics from the V2 uh, profiler and the profiler actually it measures uh, the number of pipeline slots that has been spent during the execution and uh, the retiring ones are the, are the ones that actually get retired which means they are the actual effective execution in the pipeline slots. The other numbers are just uh, wasted uh, uh, slots, maybe due to the uh, waiting for the memory access or due to the, the speculation uh, or something, yeah. So is your method providing any solution to this? The uh, no, no, uh, it's not my, my uh, method, it's uh, the way to and profiler provide this. Actually it's the proof, I think the proof will, uh, tools and can 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 get this counter from the uh, the, the 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 PMU in the CPU uh, in the CPU chip. Yeah. Okay. And any other questions for the speaker? Okay. Uh, let's move on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So let me bring the fourth uh, talk up. Hello. So this will be a talk from uh, the Chinese Academy of uh, Sciences for a parallel methods uh, in virtual machines. I think we, uh, this one is recorded a bit at a lower volume. I'll try to switch uh, to a different set Mark of speakers and see if uh, we can hear better. And let me 
you rewind the top a couple of minutes. The referee gets the hypervisor lost or not even limited to the event that the system receives. The replay means the hypervisor uses the recorded information to record the state of the future of a whole the and system to the minute to This is the event. It is the plan to a wide variety of applications. For example, every recorder uses replay to recover the system of conflict containment. It's the E and RRC leverages this framework to pass down our type analysis to the same state. In fact, our plan is to analyze love related issues and the profile of application with decision theory replacement. Many of our applications are performed the theory replace according to the introduction. However, the replace performance cannot make practical requirements. This problem is not in two factors, offline replace and simple type replace as the most frequently in this number. The offline replace means that replace is performed after original execution has been completed. Well, the single type replace means that there exists only one replace asset at the moment. With this in mind, we propose a parallel replace framework for the gamma as the demonstrated in this window. During the record stage, CMR claims that the end execution is the main slide with the bacterial recovery system continuous snapshot. With this snapshot, it enables all demand replay by rewriting the system to any existing snapshot. In addition, it supports to for multiple replays from the same slide for different analysis of them, keeping the slide independently for parallel analysis. Next, let's introduce the set part. This is the architecture of our Java framework. It consists of the record component and replay component. The left side shows how the record component works. Specifically, when a VN record is requested, the record component of the recorder. The recorder first takes snapshots to see the running state of our VM, which is different from nature work. And then, it records the execution of a whole VM system near the hypervisor. In this way, the snapshot leads the VM execution into many slices, each of which involves a snapshot there along with a log there. The rest that denotes the workflow of the replay component. For each replay, it creates a replayer. The replayer first allows the snapshot view to roll back the VM to the state of the snapshot point, then switching the event from the log sphere and set it into the VM to replay the execution. Each, each slide contains the complete state and the execution check with a period. It can be replayed independently, enabling parallel replay of any slide at any time. There is the many challenges to realize this framework. The most critical way is the data integrity and the consistency for enabling parallel replay. We employ a two layer data snapshot mechanism to solve this problem. Upon each replay, it first creates a core basic snapshot of the disk unit to record the state of this. So that the disk state at the time of a snapshot is frozen. Meanwhile, it deliberates the whole mission again to generate a trail image from the baseband image. So that the baseband image is very old and works as a backing up cell. After that, that operation to this well theoretic dedicated to the child image. Upon replay, the clone an image from the child image for each repair. That repair based on the children image and rewind the disk state using the first layer called laptop. Based on this framework, we propose two kinds of parallel replay modes. 
body slash parallel repeat and the most is measure parallel repeat. Let's first begin the multi slash parallel repeat. It means multiple repairs of both the branch string slices simultaneously for parallel or analogy. For real time repeat, multiple repairs should be scheduled to keep up with the record. This finger illustrates how to reduce the delay of repeat using two repairs. This replay runs much slower than the record in the most effective system. The body slash parallel replay is essential in many scenarios by saving up the replay. Body dimensional replay means that the many replays are created to replace the same slides but for different purposes. It is useful for generics such as the security uh, analysis and the board diagnosis. For example, it can perform security analysis from perspective of upper overflow and use after free concurrently on different repairs. Next, evaluation on our framework. This is our experimental setup. Firstly, we compare the performance quality of CLR against in fact, which is a native on our framework. We think that the performance quality improved by CLR is a bit higher than that of in fact. The extra loss is introduced by continuous snapshot. Accordingly, the penalty of CLR is the habit and overall increasing change with a decrease of the selection interval. Although a smaller recovery includes a fair loss, it delivers the production of more slices, which can be further used to provide hair parallelization upon repair stage. Therefore, a user can determine an appropriate snapshot interval according to specific needs. Then, we have measured the performance of the RR against the fact when performing the analysis. The research showed that the diagnostic type of single type replace is almost the same as that of inside. So the penalty is used by logic that not is mechanical. As expected, using down up so the same can be accelerated by parallel repeat. The improvement is the main consistency to the parallelization of the by multi side parallel repeat. Next, we employ multi dimensional diagnostic to the same system. Different from the two slides but perform the analysis on different aspects. As we can see, the two repairs must form a multi dimensional diagnosis to make them than the single security one. In conclusion, this simple upgrading and parallel retain framework for the commercial compared with the native on our framework. Our framework supports two kinds of parallel repair modes. They are multi slice parallel repair and multi divider parallel repair, which are useful for various requirements. For the future work, further works on reducing the storage and performance costs in a recording record state, scheduling repair, repairs to follow balance, and visualizing remote the parallel repair. This is my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Um, is the speak, speaker here? Oh, yes. Hi, uh, your voice is uh, low, but again, uh, could you, uh, um, well, let's ask, uh, are there any questions from audience? Okay, um, yeah. I, I just said a question on uh, the motivation. Uh, why do we need parallel playback? Uh, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, the motivation is that uh, uh, there are many analyses so it's time consuming. Uh, that so we pro so we propose the parallel replay to improve uh, the uh, diagnosis performance by using multiple repairs um, simultaneously. So it helps you uh, 
it helps speed up diagnosis, basically. Uh, the benefit is to speed up standard way of diagnosing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, and what, what kind of issues do you diagnose? Uh, such as uh, mm, uh, C-scores, C-score diagnosis. Uh, sorry, I couldn't hear that word. Uh, uh, such as uh, uh, system core diagnosis. Uh, okay. Uh, and it looks like you collaborated with uh, cyber emergency response team. Uh, could you comment on that? How, like, are they planning to use this system? Uh, yeah, we work together to do, uh, to do some research on this system. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any any other questions from the audience? All right. Thank you. So I'll try to move to the next uh, one, uh, which will be a talk talk by Tom. Hi. Okay, so this will be uh, uh, a fast asynchronous uh, NOC. Uh, NLC simulator. I'm Simi Sopas and Versatile NLC simulator. I'm Tom Blind and I am personally on behalf of all the owners. For Versatile topic and for chips with a large number of heterogeneous IPs, a synchronous NLC is better than synchronous NLC for facilitating communication. For the fast design process of a synchronous NLC, an asynchronous NLC simulator that can simulate real traffic in a detailed manner is necessary. In the paper, the architectural details of ANSYNC, including the asynchronous router implementation and how it can be configured are provided. We are also highlighting some of the critical use cases of ANSYNC by taking an open source router framework. Analysis of asynchronous and heterogeneous synopsis for the design process should check multiple aspects of the NOC. The traffic it carries, the size of the NOC based on the components it connects, the effect on packet latency due to different routing algorithms, the impact of pairing wireless, etc. Looking at the high-level architecture of ANSI, the input consists of a configuration file and a trace file. The output consists of latency and throughput reports, power reports, and power gating reports. ANSI is modular and consists of five main modules. The Booksim module inherits the code base of Booksim 2 and provides a topology-related functionality for ANSI. The NetRace module provides tracing facility with dependency validation. MT module is the brain of the simulator and controls the timing path of the simulator. Orion 3 and power gating module monitors the activity in the NOC and generates power reports. Moving to the asynchronous router model, the router is modeled as five different units that mirror real world router's functionality. Even queues activate each of the units. The empty module instructs the router units on how to populate the event queues. Orion 3 and power gating models snoop on the event queues to tally all the activity in the NOC. Taking a closer look at the contents of the simulator configuration file, they mainly consist of six categories of configuration. The physical aspects of the NOC, the policy-related matters, the timing-related configurations, the workload specifications, power and power gating parameters. Team was a state-of-the-art asynchronous NOC simulator, but it was neither fast nor capable of running real workloads to completion. Paint splits the application into a client-server configuration for asynchronicity. The synchronization is done using IPC socket communication. This has a huge performance impact, both in terms of runtime and space requirements. Ansem is monolithic and compiled and uses even queues to handle asynchronicity, providing scalable performance across different NFC configurations. Now, let us take a look at some of the important use cases of Ansem. For asynchronous simulation, the multi even queue based architecture of Ansem allows for different granularities of time. 
for small granularities of time, the simulation times are small, but more precise. When designing an NOC, it is necessary to know the operating limits of the NOC. The null load latency, the injection rate at which the NOC saturates are very important. Comparing various synchronous, asynchronous and heterogeneous NOCs under different conditions is necessary to identify a candidate NOC. Identifying the exact behavior of the candidate NOC under the recent application is also important. Here we consider PASOC applications, asynchronous TNOC based NOCs outperform the synchronous. One of the dangers associated with deploying asynchronous NOCs is arbitration meta stability. Meta 20, 40, and 60 denote the synchronizer circuit delays in nanoseconds. You can see that the effect is evident at high injection rates. So it is necessary to find the effect on destined applications. While designing NOCs, power reports provide feedback to prevent power provisioning of resources. The graph shows the component wise breakdown of power for asynchronous NOCs and different parser projects. Concluding the work, Hansen can compare NOCs that are fully synchronous, fully asynchronous, mixed synchronous, and asynchronous. It provides 25 times speed up compared to state of the art trace based simulators while providing more functionalities. It supports a wide variety of analysis under different conditions. Simulator will be made publicly available in the GitHub link. I would like to thank the authors of Paint for providing the RTL source code for routers they use in their head. I thank the members of Nano DC Lab and IIT Gandhinagar for providing a fertile space for research. This work is supported through multiple grants as shown. Thank you. All right. Uh, <clears throat> thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Tom. Uh, so, uh, any questions from audience? So this was a talk from uh, Ashokar University in India. Um, and I think there's another one, IIT uh, Ganti Nagar. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I was uh, going to ask, uh, you mentioned in your, uh, again, again, it's more of a motivation question, but you mentioned that asynchronous simulation is better. Why do you think it is better than synchronous? Uh, the simulation is not better. It's much harder to do. But uh, what I was uh, saying was asynchronous analysis perform better compared to synchronous uh, analysis. Uh, for larger chips. Mm -hmm. And what, why do you think so, that's the case? Can, uh, be, can you give us because, uh, some idea, high level idea, why you think that is the case? Uh, because for applications such as, uh, you know, regular applications with burst chain traffic uh, or data access patterns that are burst, you are unpredictable, something similar to cache misses. Uh, the actual CPU is actually waiting for the data to come back from the RAM. And when you are employing asynchronous analysis with asynchronous routers, uh, they usually perform better compared to an Apple-to-Apple -Apple comparison synchronous router. Mm -hmm. So are the latency any... of... Huh? Yeah, go ahead. So uh, the main idea is that even if we have that, we really do not know how it happens at a system level. And simulating that becomes difficult because of the you know clock versus real world clock um, aspect of these asynchronous routers. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier, the, the entire project came out of the requirement to design application specific uh, NOC routers uh, that are both synchronous as well as asynchronous, and there was no real way to compare both of them. And this is a byproduct of that. Mm -hmm. And are there any disadvantages of uh, doing the simulation asynchronously? Uh, the, sim the asynchronous simulations uh, usually take much longer time compared to synchronous ones because of the granularity of time at which we are handling the simulation. Um, in terms of uh, synchronous designs, we can, you know, we just need to activate or transition signals at the clock signal. But whereas uh, in the case of asynchronous ones, we need to uh, think of time as a continuous entity and we cannot just uh, simply discretize it. So for better precision, we need to take a look at it much closer. Okay, thank you. And any questions thank from you. the audience? I'll ask again, although the audience has been quite a bit. 
So, all right, we'll move to the next one then. Hello everyone, my name is Zheng Xi. I'm a PhD student from Institute of Computing Technology, Chinese Academy of Science. I'm so happy to be here to give a presentation of our recent research. I will first introduce this work's background and motivation, then the method, next the experiments and evaluation, and finally the conclusion. Our work mainly aims to accelerate tensor comp compilation of deep learning compilers. As we know, convolution is the most important operation in deep learning. There are seven loops in a regular convolution. For each loop, we could make use of loop tailing or unrolling techniques to fully reduce the weight or neuron data, also known as catch locality. But there are maybe billions of combinations of different loop tailing and unrolling parameters, each corresponding to different hardware performance. So how to decide which one is the best com uh, configuration is what tensor compilation wants to solve. Current mainstream solution is AutoTVM. AutoTVM proposes a machine learning tuning method, which leverages the cost model to represent the performance of the configurations. The exploration module is used to find a group of configurations with best predicted performance. Then these configurations will be sent to the computing backend for hardware testing, obtaining its real performance. These configurations with real performance then being used to update the cost model. After a certain of iterations, we choose the best performance from all hardware testings. Its corresponding configurations is also the final compiling result. But, but the whole process takes a long time. For example, tuning a mobile net V2 with nine tasks on a Tesla V100 for 500 trails costs nearly um, 19 hours in total. Some research have already seen methods to accelerate the compiling process. For example, a convolution clustering method aims to save tuning time in the task level. This work is orthogonal with our method. Another work is Chameleon. It improves AutoTVM by replacing AutoTVM's exploration module with adaptive exploration based on reinforcement learning, and then uses um, adaptive sampling method to select configurations to run on hardware. However, before using Chameleon, we need to uh, firstly tune its hyperparameters, which also cost time and engineering efforts. So we break down the time consumption of AutoTVM and find that hardware test takes the most of the time. Besides, AutoTVM at, uh, exploration module finds configurations readily based on the cost model, which does not take the distribution of candidate configurations into consideration. Actually, the distribution of configuration are not uniform or balanced, and there exists a large amount of invalid configurations. Learning from the mixture of both valid and invalid configurations hinders the cost model's beta convergence. Hardware testing for these invalid samples are also a waste of time. To address these problems, we propose ART, a novel automatic tensor tuning method based on active learning to improve not only the speed, but also the performance of the compilation. Our key idea is to uh, reduce the number of hardware tests while still maintaining the functionality of the cost model. In terms of this, uh, active learning could help us. It is often used. Uh, it is often being used on the situation where um, labeled samples are real, while labeling is extremely expensive. 
it leverages different criteria to uh, select the more valuable samples that contain more information, making the cost model learning better with less labeled samples. ART maintains the uh, uh, overall architecture of auto TDM and replaces the acceleration module with our novel active learning acceleration module. It consists of three parts, including a filter, uh, an active learning a sampling module, and a score predict module. During an iteration, uh, the filter is used to find those configurations that have high possibilities to be invalid. These configurations won't be tested on real hardware. The active learning sampling <coughs> module selects particular samples based on a certain criteria. The score, predictor, uh, the score predict module is used to track how such an active learning sampling module helps to improve the performance of the cost model. The active learning select module is the key component of the exploration process. We choose two select criteria. One is sample diversity and the other is sample uncertainty. We use lots of samples to represent the uncertainty. When using the uncertainty uh, sampling method, um, there exists a time lag problem between the loss predictor and the cost model score predictor. So we need to find an organic way to combine these two parts. We design a novel ping pong way of iteration between the loss predictor and the score predictor. If at the first time step, it is the score predictor to emit configurations then, at the next time step, the last, last predictor will take turns. In our experiment, we uh, compare ART with AutoTM and Chameleon. This table presents our selected benchmarks, uh, which choose three end-to-end -end modern deep learning networks and eight independent tuning tasks um, extracted from the three models. This figure show uh, shows how ART helps to accelerate tensor compilation. With the active learning exploration module, ART US is able to find its best performance of 9.65 T flops flop at the 373 trail on a Tesla V100, uh, while AutoTVM can only get a suboptimal performance of 8.15 kickboxes at 945th trail. This figure summarizes detailed performance of ALT with eight representative convolution tasks on two backends. Averagely, ALT US reduces the number of hardware tests by three times, much greater than ALT VS. In terms of performance, ALTUS achieves 1.17 times to 1.19 times improvement on the two backends. For end-to-end -end inference time uh, improvement, uh, based on outstanding individual test performance, ALTUS can obtain 4% to 7% improvement on the two backends. For optimizing speed up over AutoTVM, ALTUS performs the best with 1.93 times and 2.49 times on, on, on the true backend respectively. Chameleon also achieves comparable optimizing time reduction to LTUS. In the conclusion, we propose an automatic tensor compilation method called ALT based on active learning to optimizing the compilation procedure. Experiments on a set of real deep learning networks show that our efficient active learning exploration module can select informative samples and help to quick, quickly build the cost model, thus emitting better tuning results at an earlier time. That's all, thank you. Now, if you have any questions, please feel free to discuss with me. All right. Uh... Thank you. So this was another talk from Chinese uh, Academy of Sciences. Any questions from the audience?
Um, so, so Z, I'll try to ask a question. Uh, so this ALT method, is this something that you developed from scratch or is it using an existing machine learning technique? Uh, ALT is also a machine learning algorithm. It is based on active learning. Uh, it's a branch of machine learning. Okay. And uh, mm -hmm. what is the difference between uh, the, maybe I, maybe you mentioned in some slide, but ALT US versus DS, what, are, what is the difference? Uh, well, active learning, uh, you, uh, Different active learning algorithm use different selection criteria. So we, uh, in this paper, we choose two uh, select uh, criteria. One is sample uncertainty, which is short for, uh, which is short as US, uh, and other is sample diversity. Um, we use uh, DS to represent it. Okay. So it's. Uh, two different selection criteria. Mm -hmm. And these perform better than things like reinforcement learning? Uh, um, reinforcement, uh, we, we didn't use reinforcement no, no, learning the, in this paper. The, yeah, the previous work was using reinforcement learning. So do you uh, perform better than that? Yeah, but um, the chameleon, you, 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 did, you, you mentioned the chameleon using the reinforcement learning, but we, uh, the, uh, the reinforcement, reinforcement learning and active learning are using different uh, um, aspects. So we can't uh, compare them directly. Mm -hmm. okay. um, All right. So any, any remaining questions from the audience? Okay, thank you. Computing technology, Chinese. We will move to the uh, last uh, talk uh, this uh, session. So let me uh, bring that one up. I'm from University of California, Riverside. And the title of today's presentation is Chain-Based Fixed Priority Scheduling of Loosely Dependent Task. I will start with a motivational example of autonomous vehicle. In general, there are two phases in order for a driving car to start completely. First, the time when a driver or a machine recognizes an obstacle and apply a brake. The second phase is the process of decelerating from the initial speed of the vehicle after the brake starts to operate. So the total stopping distance of a vehicle is composed of perception reaction distance, which is A, and braking deceleration distance, which is B. The distance B is determined by the initial speed and the physics of the vehicle, so it is uncontrollable and unavoidable. However, in autonomous vehicle system, the distance A can be varied by the performance of the perception response of the system. The perception of the autonomous vehicle system is generally a complex flow of information and it can be implemented as a chain with many tasks. Our work focuses on such a chain. As mentioned in the previous slide, an autonomous vehicle is a good example of chain of tasks with data dependency. Sensing tasks collect data from sensors and using those data, computation tasks perform operation such as localization, detection, and motion planning. Then in actuation stage, control task manipulates steering or throttle based on the latest result from computations. In this system, each task of chains executes and produces 
output at its own rate, and no strict persistence constraints are imposed. In the sense of that, we call this type of chain loosely dependent chain. Loosely dependent chain are widely used, for example, PopSub model in WASP and read execute write semantics in AutoSAR and gives flexibility in system design, scheduling, and information sharing. Therefore, our goal in this study, we want to minimize the entire end-to-end -end latency of such a chains. The state of the art inspires our work. However, most of prior works studied the upper bound of latency based on the worst case response time, and that based scheduling limits for the system where synchronous tasks run their own periods and priorities. Therefore, in our work, we propose a new chain-based fixed price scheduler and present an analytical method. Our work significantly outperforms the state of the art. It achieves up to 83% reduction in the end-to-end -end latency system model. We consider a multi-core system with partitioned fixed priority scheduling. A task model consists of the best case, the worst case execution time, and each task has its own period, deadline, initial offset, and a unique priority. We denote a chain as a set of tasks that are composed of start, intermediate, and end task. And various types of change are valid, including ritual tasks as shown in this figure. Now I'm going to introduce our chain-based scheduler. Basically, it has two components, offline and online part. Offline part builds chain instance and distinguish effective chain instance among them. Effective chain instance is the earliest chain instance producing a valid and updated final output using the most recently updated input data. Offline parts consist of two steps. In the first step, the start task of a chain releases a new chain instances. And then in the second step, releases job from intermediate and end task are assigned to all possible chain instances. In our approach, the inclusion of a job into a chain instance is determined by its release time because the release time is the earliest start time of a job and the updated input data is not ready before the start of execution. Throughout these steps, we generate many job level chain instances. In the below figure, those connected with three pair means individual chain instances and jobs are assigned when they are released. Effective chain instances are indicated by red arrows, and there are four effective chain instances during hyper period in this example. Now the runtime part. In online part, we introduce and apply so-called release and release policy. In release phase, a job is alive based on its period, but cannot start execution. And then when previous jobs of the same chain instance have completed their execution, the released job switches into ready phase. Then all jobs in ready phase are scheduled based on their task priority. The operation of ready phase is carried out according to categories where the job belongs to. And there are three categories. First, if a job is assigned to only a single chain instance and it is not a start task, the transition can occur when the immediately prior job of the same chain instance completes. That is rule one. In case for job is included in multiple chains, rule one should be satisfied for all of its effective instance individually, and this is rule two. Lastly, if a job does not belong to any effective instance, it is dropped by scheduler at runtime. With RNR policy and these rules, runtime part of our scheduler improves the end-to-end -end latency by preventing a necessarily early start of job execution. In this slide, I will briefly explain about our analysis framework, and for more details, please reference our paper. The end-to-end -end latency of chain can be analyzed in two steps. First, we compute the lower bound start time and the upper bound finish time of individual jobs. In this step, self-suspension effect caused by release phase and interference from higher priority jobs of other change are considered. Then iterate until those bounds are converged. After we compute bounds of each job, 
then the end-to-end latency can be captured by taking maximum among difference between upper bound of finish time of last task and lower bound start time of starting task of the chain. One of the benefits of our analysis framework is that this approach can be used to analyze the latency under a conventional chain unaware scheduler with a small modification. Now we evaluate our latency analysis framework. We compare our work with the state of the art. There are two most recent work which propose the latency analysis on the chain unaware scheduling. SFARM and CDS are our work. SFARM is our start and finish time based analysis under chain unaware scheduling and CBS is the proposed analysis under our chain-based scheduler. We use 500 task set with seven tasks each for each utilization. The chain consists of N tasks, where N is three, five, or seven. So the lab tasks are considered hard real-time tasks, which can be modeled as a single task chain. As is expected, we can observe the overall latency rises as N or the utilization increases and our proposed schedule with analysis outperforms others. In particular, when the utilization is 0.9 with N is 7, CBS achieves up to 83% reduction in the end-to-end -end latency. This time, we compare multiple chains that include a sharing task. We use nine tasks with utilization of 0.8. Each task set forms two chains with a mutual task. A mutual task is placed at the start and or intermediate in the chain. We also tested 500 randomly generated task set. The blue-green bar represent the result of chain one, while the red-yellow are for the chain two. As expected, we observed that our two approaches significantly outperform the other for all chain sets. We have conducted more evaluation about interchain distance and on multi-core environment and those are in our paper. In this work, we propose a new chain-based fixed priority scheduling and the end-to-end -end latency analysis framework. Our scheduler outperforms the state-of-the-art in terms of the end-to-end -end latency. Our analysis also can be utilized for conventional chain unaware scheduling. As our future work, we will implement our scheduler in a real robotic platform and evaluate. Also, we are interested in investigating the time unpredictability caused by shared memory resources in multi-core platforms. Thank you for listening. Hello, my start All right, thank you. Uh, so I, I believe the uh, speaker is here still. Um, so this was a talk by UC Riverside, as I remind you. So I, I guess stuck it, uh, uh, at this motivation, uh, it seemed like from this example, uh, the the reaction time seems uh, very slow. Is this reasonable? I would expect like to be the breaking distance to be much longer than a. Yeah. Uh, based on this table, I think the still the portion of A is uh, uh, about forty percent for the entire the stopping distance. So I think uh, A and B both are important, but uh, as I said, the B part actually we cannot uh, control it. So it's basically based on the speed of the uh, car and also it's the physics of the car. But for the A part, we can actually manipulate it by controlling. Uh, based on our system's performance. For human driving, actually the response time of A and it's like the, the human to recognize the obstacle and to try to put the brake, those parts are you know, included in A so we can actually control it. Yeah, so this one, uh, yeah, the way I was thinking is maybe like- Disconnected, smartphone connected. Oh, sorry. I was thinking uh, may maybe stopping the car would take like two seconds, whereas the response time should be like in milliseconds. So maybe I was thinking A should be like on average 10 times faster than B. Yeah. Uh, but 
yeah, in my, in my opinion, I think the part of A is still important and kind of like the, around the 40% of the entire distance. So. Yes, A is definitely important. Uh, what I'm saying, the numbers here didn't make mm -hmm. too much sense to me. Um, but uh, we can assume that the autonomous cars react faster than human beings, right? Is that correct? Uh, I actually, I'm not sure because that, and basically this table is based on the human's direction, not based on the autonomous driving car. Oh, I see. And I think it's pretty similar or, uh, yeah, but we don't have a data on that, so I cannot say the, which one is the best. Yeah. Okay, any questions from the audience? Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll let you speak, uh, Major. Uh, so, basically, this concludes this uh, session. Uh, so, thanks for uh, attending and sticking to the end uh, for uh, most of you. And uh, so currently the time is 11, uh, sorry, 1241 Eastern and we are uh, right on time, maybe has one minute. Uh, and there won't be anything uh, after this session. So uh, yeah, let me, just, let me just show you the schedule. So you could uh, try switching over to the security session, which will start in about 20 uh, minutes. Uh, if you wanted to do something, uh, it's um, all. Uh, I'm sorry for interruption. It's all. It's almost done. The the first session as well. So I think like around 1 p.m. we are gonna uh, join the best paper announcement session. So you know it has different Zoom sessions meeting ID. Uh, please switch to another one after this session. Yeah, but I was referring to the security. Oh, it's almost done as oh, well. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Yeah. I got confused because like, uh, all right, I see. I know, it's almost but, okay, done. Okay, I guess they'll only catch the last 10 minutes if they do that, sorry. Okay, and, I also would like to say a few words. Hey, this is your captain speaking. Thank you very much, all of you to, for attending and the, the, and presenting these great papers. This was, as, as it was already said, the last session in, in the last technical session in in the conference and we're inviting you at one o'clock to attend the best paper award and the closing session for this conference. Thank you very much. And don't 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 forget to make submissions uh, next year as well. So we look forward to yes. seeing you next year. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, thank you.